Most trains disappeared because they wore out or became obsolete. Imagine a tank car so immense, so unwieldy, that the industry quietly erased it. Its length of 97 feet and its jaw-dropping capacity of 60,000 gallons proving too much for even the boldest rail engineers. Official records barely mention its struggle to navigate America's twisted tracks, yet rumors of its failure haunt railway lore. What secret forced the rail whale into museum exile, and what other bizarre prototypes are hidden beneath the surface of rail history? If you are ready to uncover the true limits of mechanical ambition, you are in the right place. A scale test car sits alone on a siding, squat and unassuming. A steel box no longer than a delivery van, yet dense enough to match the weight of a loaded coal car. Its true purpose is hidden beneath layers of paint and stenciled warnings, do not hump. Inside, every pound is accounted for, stacked in cast iron or steel plates, calibrated to within a fraction of a percent. Inspectors treat these cars with the care of jewelers because a single jolt can throw off months of precise measurements. This is precision work. The entire freight billing system depends on these rolling standards. Their mass, 25 tons, 35 tons, sometimes 50 tons, ensuring that every shipment of grain or ore is weighed fairly. Routing crews isolate them from rough handling, diverting them away from the chaos of switching yards. One inspector recalls the nervous silence as a test car rolled onto the scale, knowing that even a minor error could ripple across a railroad's books. This hidden world of railroading hints at the lengths railroads go to manage the outliers, the strange, the fragile, the massive, each demanding its own set of exceptions. In the late 1960s, a new kind of hopper car began to appear on American railroads, one that looked more like a beached whale than a piece of rolling stock. Its curved, swollen body was designed to solve a stubborn problem, how to unload fine powders like cement or flour without leaving half the cargo stuck to the walls. Inside, a network of steel ducts ran beneath the load, channeling blasts of air at pressures reaching 50 to 80 pounds per square inch. These jets fluidized the powder, turning it into a churning, liquid-like mass that could flow out of the car's bottom gates. The process demanded careful engineering. Too little pressure and the powder clumped. Too much pressure and clouds of dust escaped, wasting product and fouling the air. An engineer from the era recalled the challenge. We had to build the car around the airflow, not the other way around. Compared to the air slide system's fabric floors and lower pressure, the whale belly hoppers were a leap in both capacity and complexity. Their bulbous shape was more than a visual oddity. It was a direct response to the limits of physics, pushing the boundaries of what a single rail car could carry and unload efficiently. A single rail car stretched nearly the length of one and a half city buses, 97 feet from coupler to coupler, its tank swollen with the promise of 60,000 gallons of pressurized chemical. Designed by GATX in the early 1970s, the so-called rail whale was built to move anhydrous ammonia or liquefied petroleum gas in volumes no one had attempted before. On paper, the numbers dazzled. One car could do the work of four cutting runs and labor. Dispatchers studying route maps saw the problem immediately. Standard mainline curves laid out decades earlier for 40-foot and 50-foot cars forced the rail whale's chassis to twist and strain. On tighter turns, the overhang threatened signals and platforms, and the car's immense weight pressed against the rails with every degree of curvature. Crews found it nearly impossible to route safely through yards and industrial spurs. Regulators and engineers debated its future, but the math was unforgiving. The industry's effective ceiling, 89 feet for tankers, became a hard stop. The lone rail whale, too big for the system it was built to serve, now stands silent at the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, a monument to ambition outpaced by geometry. The Santa Fe Superhopper arrived in the 1990s with a bold promise, 
it would move more grain faster and with fewer cars. Instead of a string of individual hoppers, engineers linked three aluminum bodies together into a single articulated set, which crews nicknamed the daisy chain. Each unit shared wheels with its neighbor, stretching the whole assembly far longer than a standard car. The payoff was immediate. A single super hopper could haul nearly 30% more grain than five traditional hoppers combined, thanks to lighter construction and fewer gaps between cars. But the design handed new headaches to the people working the rails. Loading crews found themselves wrangling synchronized gates and awkward walkways, trying to balance grain evenly across three swaying sections. A Santa Fe operations planner recalled the first trial run, saying it looked like efficiency on paper, but in the yard it was a bottleneck. Unloading took longer too, as each compartment demanded careful sequencing to avoid jams. Most of these aluminum giants were retired after a decade, but one survivor still stands at the Oklahoma Railway Museum, a relic of the endless push and pull between capacity and practical workflow. A patent drafter in the early 1970s faced a puzzle, how to fit more cars onto a train without crushing the cargo. The answer became the Southern Pacific vert a pack a rail car designed for one job delivering the compact Chevy Vega. Instead of the standard 18 vehicles, the Vert APAC packed 30 Vegas by standing them upright, nose down in custom racks. This density demanded a new kind of engineering. Baffles and special reservoirs kept engine fluids from leaking, a detail captured in patent drawings that read more like a chemistry set than an auto hauler. Warehouse packers marveled at the system. 30 cars in the space of 18, each secured against the jostle of a thousand mile journey. But not every cargo was so forgiving. On the tobacco runs of the Southeast, boxcars grew taller and wider, sprouting 10 foot doors and skylights to handle fragile hogshead barrels. Inside, a super cushion underframe absorbed the shock of rough tracks, protecting delicate leaves and oversized tires alike. Each design reveals a different path to compatibility, shaped by what had to be moved and how gently it needed to arrive. Steel mills run on heat and risk, and nothing captures that danger like the torpedo car. Shaped like a submarine, this vessel carries molten pig iron at temperatures topping 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Inside, a thick layer of refractory brick shields the steel shell from the liquid metal's fury. Every trip is a race against time. If the iron cools too quickly, it solidifies, trapping tons of metal inside. To empty the load, operators tilt the entire car, pivoting it on massive bearings until the glowing iron pours out like lava. But the real hazard lies in the car's shifting center of gravity. If the anchors fail or the car tips too far, the weight can drag the whole train off the rails. Mill crews remember the tension as they watch the torpedo car tilt, knowing that one slip could send a river of fire across the yard. Far from the noise of the mills, a brakeman on a rural Minnesota branch line once called his ride the Hutch. Officially, it was Great Northern X41, a 50-foot boxcar grafted to a caboose cupola. It hauled less than carload freight, but also doubled as a rolling bunkhouse for crews running lonely stretches between farm towns. Pulled by stubby NW5 diesels, the Hutch was a patchwork solution for thin traffic and long winters. After retirement, its patched body found new life as a sports bar in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, a reminder that even the strangest hybrids can outlast their purpose, living on in memory and local legend. In the late 1980s, the United States Air Force quietly assembled a train unlike any other. Outwardly, these cars blended into the endless freight rolling across the Midwest, steel nondescript nothing to distinguish them from a hundred others in the yard. Inside, they carried the LGM-118, a peacekeeper, a nuclear missile powerful enough to erase a city. Each train moved with a crew of 42, launch officers, security teams, engineers, all living in tight quarters, rehearsing protocols that demanded absolute silence and precision. 
Declassified footage shows technicians checking missile seals by flashlight, their faces tense as the train idled at a rural siding. The logic was simple. If the Soviets could not find the missile, they could not destroy it. Every route, every schedule was classified. But the risks were enormous. One mistake, one exposed movement, and the secret was lost. Today, the only surviving prototype sits at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, a relic of an era when the greatest firepower on Earth rode the rails, hidden in plain sight. At the far edge of rail engineering stands the Schnabel car, a machine that turns the laws of movement into precision choreography. Empty, it stretches 230 feet longer than most city blocks. Loaded, it can reach the length of a football field, cradling transformers or turbines that weigh hundreds of tons. Hydraulic arms, each the size of a compact car, allow the cargo to shift sideways by up to 20 feet, sidestepping signals or bridge pillars with a flick of a lever. Every journey is mapped in advance, with surveyors charting every curve and crossing. On the main line, speed drops to a crawl from 15 to 25 miles per hour because a single miscalculation could mean disaster. For heavy haul planners, the Schnabel is both a marvel and a puzzle, demanding total control over every mile it travels. Every extreme experiment, real or rumored, pushes the boundaries of what railroads can carry and of what they can imagine. Today, as supply chains demand more, the limits of engineering are still up for debate. Sometimes the boldest ideas leave only questions behind. What would you dare to build next?